Hello, can you hear me okay? Is it okay? Yes. All right. Uh, hi, I am Francisca Spritzler. I am a registered dietitian and a certified diabetes educator from California. And I'm a low carb dietitian, but that hasn't always been the case. I was a traditional dietitian for many years. I uh, became a dietitian in my um, early 40s. I went back to school because I wanted to help people get healthier by eating the way I did. So um, I followed a pescatarian diet that's primarily vegetarian with seafood, very low fat, lots of whole grains, and I also snacked quite a bit because I got hungry between meals. I don't know if any of you who have followed a high carb diet in the past have experienced this, but I certainly did. And uh, my snacks were also balanced with whole grains and maybe some protein in there too, because I wanted to be balanced, of course. And uh, that's what my plate looked like, that healthy plate, the half vegetables, a quarter of, health, of whole grains and a quarter of protein. That's what I did and that's what I recommended to all of my patients. I told them just eat the way that I do and you can manage your diabetes. This is the way to do it. And I honestly felt that was the case. Until about uh, February of 2011 when my husband and I received our uh, results from uh, life insurance labs. I don't know how it works in Australia, but in the United States, if you apply for life insurance, you have to go through a battery of tests to make sure you don't have um, some terrible condition. So uh, I expected everything to come back pretty normal, except my cholesterol would probably be high. But I was a little concerned when I started looking down at the blood glucose. Uh, my fasting blood glucose was fine. But then I looked at the A1C, and although my A1C is uh, the top value in the normal range at 5.6, that was a lot higher than it should have been. For somebody following the kind of diet that I did, I was the same weight that I am now, and I didn't have um, any other risk factors for diabetes. So I was concerned about that. I was even more concerned when I saw that my fructosamine was outside of the normal range. So life insurance, they do fructosamine first, and if that's out of range, they'll do your A1C. And uh, my A1C came back normal, but that fructosamine, um, that's a more recent indicator of blood sugar values. It's the difference between that and your A1C um, is that your fructosamine measures your blood sugar average over three weeks versus three months uh, for the hemoglobin A1C. So I had to figure out what was going on. My fasting blood sugar was normal. So obviously, my blood sugars were going up after meals or the lab had made a mistake twice, and I had to figure out what it was, so I bought a glucometer and I started testing my blood sugar. And I ate my normal meals, I didn't count up carbs, but I counted them after I ate, and it turned out that I was eating about 50 to 60 grams most of the time. And I expected normal blood sugar results, um, and I was really surprised to see that I was spiking after every meal that I ate. And in fact, I was going up to diabetes levels where I could be diagnosed with diabetes if I ate a certain amount of carbohydrates. So, um, by the way, during this time, I was studying to be a certified diabetes educator. So my life revolved around diabetes when I was at home studying and when I saw my patients at work, I was looking at their hemoglobin A1Cs and their blood sugars. So I was getting the feeling that things were just not right with me and uh, I didn't know what was going on. Did I have type 2 diabetes, just an early stage? Did I have MODI? That is a type of type 2 diabetes with a strong genetic component. It stands for Maturity Onset Diabetes in Youth and it's kind of a misnomer because it actually occurs in adults up to 50 years of age. Um, so I thought that could be a possibility. And then LADA, which is type 1 diabetes, but it's the type that adults get. It stands for latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. And uh, it progresses very slowly versus type 1 usually presents uh, very acutely in, in children. So I thought that could be um, as well. So I had no idea what was going on, but I did know three things. Uh, that your fasting blood sugar is the last value to deteriorate. So you can have fasting blood sugar within the normal range while your postprandial or postmeal blood sugars are going up um, within a couple of years. And then it starts to affect your A1C and finally affects your fasting blood sugar. I also knew that uh, your postprandial blood glucose level, if that goes up too high, that's what's causing the damage. It's not having a sustained uh, you know, blood sugar 
in the hundreds for fasting. It's still not a good thing, but the worst thing you can do is to spike after meals because that's what causes damage to your blood vessels and nerves, and it can also damage the beta cells of your pancreas that produce insulin. Um, and finally, the total carbohydrate content of the meal is the most important factor in raising your blood sugar after meals. So since I had normal blood sugar when it was fasting and elevated uh, after I ate, um, it was obvious that I needed to cut back on carbohydrates. But I was already following the healthy plate. The advice that I was giving all my patients, this was supposed to help to control diabetes. And I figured if it wasn't working for me, who, you know, I may or may not have diabetes or early, some type of early uh, diabetes, but what about people with established diabetes who obviously cannot uh, process carbohydrates well? What was this diet doing to them? So instead of just looking at the ADA recommendations and the recommendations from the Academy of Nutrition and Diet, Nutrition and Dietetics, I went online and did some research into what people with diabetes were doing to control their blood sugar. The first site I found was 2diabetes.org. Has anyone heard of that or uses it? Anyone with diabetes? Um, it's a wonderful resource for people with both type 1 and type 2. All different types of diets on there. Um, not everyone's low carb, but what I noticed very early on is that the people who had the best results in their blood sugars and the best results on their A1Cs, the fewest complications and the fewest hypos if they were taking insulin, they were all following some form of carbohydrate restriction. And uh, I then looked at studies, and not just the studies that um, the ADA was basing their recommendations on. I looked at everything, and I found that low-carbohydrate diets consistently outperform low-fat diets and even the low-glycemic index diets. And then I read some books. Uh, I don't have time to go into them too much, but um, Dr. Bernstein has type 1 diabetes. He's a, a wonderful man who's managed with a very low-carbohydrate diet for the last 40 years or so. And Steve Parker does not have diabetes, but recommends it because he's seen how much it can help his patients. And finally, Jenny Rule, she actually does have that Modi that I talked about. And she was very frustrated with the advice she was getting from um, traditional dietitians and that she could not control her blood sugar. So she looked elsewhere and started following a carb-restricted diet. So what? Um, so I never had, uh, I was tested for Modi, but I was, I did test my antibodies to see if I possibly had that slow progressive type 1, and I don't. And I thought if I can't control my blood sugar by cutting back on carbs enough, I would get Modi testing, but I didn't have that much in my family, only a couple relatives. So I found that I can control my blood sugar if, as long as I stay less than 20 grams a day, I'm sorry, 20 grams per meal, and I usually do more like 10 or 15. My blood sugars are consistently less than 7.5 millimole, and, and I think that's a huge improvement. Um, and here's a brilliant quote from Jenny Rule, the one with Modi. I was emailing her a little bit and asking her, you think I'm kind of crazy for testing my blood sugar so often and doing all of this and, you know, am I being a little, um, you know, too much on this? And she said, no, I actually think that if more registered dietitians and CDEs tested their blood sugar, there'd be a lot more questioning of the ADA guidelines. And I think it's true. There's probably a lot of dietitians out there who either have prediabetes or some other kind of blood sugar reg um, dysregulation where they would see this as well. Okay, so, um, so I was really passionate. I thought, now we know how to manage diabetes. We can do this with my patients at the hospital that I worked at. I worked at a large veterans hospital. And uh, I, was, I started a blog called Low Carb Dietitian. I was writing articles, actually one for the ADA on um, restricting carbohydrates to improve blood glucose control in people with diabetes. Um, but the endocrinologists at my hospital were not interested at all. They said, oh, it's not sustainable. Our patients won't do this. There's no way. They preferred to keep them on uh, fixed insulin doses at meals. So um, they sent them to me to make sure they were eating enough carbohydrates so they didn't go low. So instead of cutting back on the insulin and cutting down on their carbohydrates, they preferred to keep business as usual. And especially uh, if they were having lows in the middle of the night, they wanted to make sure that I told them to have a good snack with plenty of carbs before they went to bed, rather than decreasing their insulin dosage or taking them off it all together if, if that was possible. So um, needless to say, I was very frustrated by this, and it was going against everything I now knew to be true. So at the end of last year, I actually left the hospital and went out on my own to just practice um, kind of without a net, all by myself, uh, no doctors looking over me, uh, just advising people on low-carbohydrate diets. 
mostly for weight management, although I do have some patients with diabetes, but no long-term results to report because I've only been doing this since January. But I do know a couple of people, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to go over one of them. Um, Steve Cooksey, I don't know if anybody is active in social media, but he is very active. He's known as a diabetes warrior. He was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes back in 2008. He had a blood glucose level of 47, which is extremely high. They told him his A1C was too high to measure, it means it was over 18%. And he freely admits he was very overweight and eating a very bad diet, lots of junk food, et cetera. They put him on insulin, uh, multiple daily injections of insulin, and also cholesterol and blood pressure medication. And he decided within a month that he was just not going to be taking this amount of medication and chasing good blood sugar control because he was unable to achieve it. So he started low carb um, February of 2009. And this is Steve today. He's at his ideal weight. His blood sugars are consistently normal, and that uh, seven is after meals. So he's usually around a four to five before meals. And uh, his A1C, he needs to have it rechecked, but based on those values, I'm sure it's somewhere around there, if not lower. Um, he was going to email me with the results if he got him back before I did this talk, but I don't think he did. And he's not on any medication anymore, none. No insulin, no diabetes meds at all. And he follows a very healthy whole foods way of living. And he always says he's thriving. He says, I'm not surviving, I'm thriving. He's very passionate. And it's a wonderful story. Uh, so the American Diabetes Association used to be steadfastly against carbohydrate restriction, but they've changed their mind within the last few years. And that's based on studies that have come out. Uh, I think Grant talked about the A to Z study earlier today, um, but that showed that after one year, uh, people on the low carbohydrate diet overall tended to do better in terms of weight loss. So they said that people could go on a uh, low carb diet for one year. Of course, the next day they had to go back to doing whatever they were doing, but one year of <laughs> low carb restriction. And uh, a few years later, they extended that to two years based on the results of the Foster study that looked at a low fat versus low carb diet. And the low carb diet, people did just as well in terms of weight loss and not having any complications. But you can see they still weren't saying anything about diabetes management. This is all for weight management, even though it's the American Diabetes Association. So finally last year, they put out a physician paper saying that low carb diets can be one of many options for uh, dietary patterns for people with diabetes. And to me, this is huge. It's not saying you have to follow the standard ADA diet anymore. You can do carb restriction, it's an option. And of course, that's what I'm recommending, and I know there's other dietitians that are recommending that, but most dietitians are still doing the low fat, high carb diet. And uh, you know, I like to think that if I hadn't had this experience with my own labs, that I would have come around to low carb on my own, but I can't say that for sure. And so I think that we need to try to encourage dietitians and educators to come over to our side, but I think we need to do that uh, diplomatically and with respect. Uh, no one wants to hear, you don't know what you're talking about, the diet that you're giving people is going to kill them. Uh, you know, that just does not, basically they just shut down. I know I would if someone told me that. So I say, share the evidence. Since dietitians are really into being evidence-based, we have lots of evidence supporting low-carb diets for diabetes. Write articles if you can get articles published. Other rights, write blog posts and share your success stories, share success stories of your friends, share Steve Cooksey's story, just share what can be done with carbohydrate restriction, the amazing improvements that you can see in your blood sugar. And then also emphasize that the low carb diet we're talking about is based on nutrient dense whole foods. It's not Atkins bars or shakes or low carb bread and tortillas because a lot of people think that. They just think low carb fat and they go right to the fad foods. But it's really this whole car I'm sorry, this uh, whole foods low carb pyramid that you see here. And that's really what we want people to get the idea of. And finally support organizations that are favorable to carb restriction and are doing research into them, like the Atkins Foundation and Nutrition and Metabolism Society and NUSI, which is Gary Taub's organization. All of those, they're strength in numbers and also the more research that we have, the more likely we are to convince dietitians and diabetes educators to come over to our side. Thank you.